So I'm Riley. Um, I've been working at Peckham for a little over a year. Um, I work in the art department, so I'm with Art from the Heart. Um, I interned with the art program like just before I got my position. Um, but I've been in my like current position for about a year. Well, I'm Marcia. Um, I've been here at Peckham almost nine years. Uh, I started out part time as a team member. I work in manufacturing. I do process mapping, continuous improvement. I started out part time as a team member, did part time for two months. Then I went full time team member for 12 months. And after a total of 14 months, I got promoted to staff. I'm Alex Modlin. I'm the manager of workforce planning. Um, I've been at Peckham for um, about 12 years. It'll be 12 years next month, actually. Um, and I started as an AmeriCorps member, did that for two years, um, and then moved into the um, intake and eligibility team where um, I did interviews um, and determined job readiness and things like that for our team members. Um, and I've been in my current job for about nine months now, 10 months. Hi, I'm Tracy Tanner. I'm the treatment specialist at Footprints, our residential facility for juvenile girls. I've been at Peckham for a little over seven and a half years. And I started in the NPIC department as a team member, moved over to our one of our CAMWA contracts as a WIOA youth specialist. And then I've been at Footprints for about two years now. I actually learned about um, MPIC from a support group that I was in um, affiliated with NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Um, there was a gentleman that would come to the group and talk about how he was working in the NPIC department. And at that time, I was pretty low functioning. And my goal was to get back to employment, being able to be employable. And he talked about what a wonderful place Peckham was and how um, that was their whole goal and mission was to be able to make you employable and to help you with whatever disability you may have, whether it was a visible disability or a non-visible disability. And so that's actually how I found my way to Peckham was through that NAMI um, support group. Well, I also um, I'm involved with coaching the Peckham Skunks, which is Special Olympics oh, basketball. Um, I just signed up for the PSAT team to support our team members there. I think I did that more so for myself because in the first meeting that we had, <coughs> excuse me, it was discussed that they're going to have a guest speaker who teaches our team members how to talk to people, how to advocate for themselves, how to set up committees. And for me, I haven't had interpersonal communications probably in 30 years. So I think it's more so me wanting to do that to better enable myself to be able to speak with people. Well, for me, mine is a non-visible, it's mental. When I came to Peckham nine years ago, it was not my first trip working for Peckham. But when I came here nine years, almost nine years ago, I was in a full blown state of depression. And I was in a place where I had to try to figure it out how to pull myself out of that dark place that I was in. So once I came here to work at Peckham with my first supervisor that I had, and all the years I had worked, been in the workforce, and the many, many different jobs that I had, this supervisor was the only one who had ever stood up for me at that point. And at that point, I knew that, oh, I'm on the right path to success here. And so that who you see before you, because I can put the supports around me to succeed different trainings. The most important training to me that Peckham gave me was when, <clears throat> excuse me, when I certified for mental health for first aid. That better enabled me to be able to recognize when someone is in distress, as well as when, my, when I'm in distress. And by taking that, Training, it really turned things around for me, is what I want to say. I took that too, and I had the same experience where I was like, okay, I can use these tools for myself mm -hmm. as much as helping others. So, yes, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things, the first time I took that, I was like, there could be like a disclaimer that this could be triggering because there were 
um, some points where I was like, I'm trying to hold myself together because this is so like close to home. Mm -hmm. So um, I did give that feedback the first time I took it. My diagnosis is also um, non-visual or yeah, um, mental health. So um, my formal diagnosis is um, severe social anxiety disorder. So this situation is a lot. (laughs) me um, and chronic PTSD um, which is from a history of trauma um, so I've had a lot of I, I think about my life and the things that I've done and I'm just like Jesus Christ like that I I've just gone through so many different things and I think Peckham I, I did not come in as a team member but I, I came in as staff, and I still had that same kind of support. I didn't have a VSS, but when I became staff, not as an AmeriCorps member, because my um, director was in Kansas, actually, but um, when I became a staff member, I had such a supportive supervisor, um, and she would recognize days where I just, it wasn't going to happen for me, right? Like, I was pretty much worthless, and I was, I felt, like, ashamed by that because I was like, Okay, so they've recognized that I've gone from AmeriCorps, and I, when I was in AmeriCorps, they were like, this person is a great employee. We want to keep her, and I'm just feeling, and I suck, right? But she would be like, go home. Go get your son. Go do something nice for yourselves. And we would go, and like, I have pictures of my oldest son, um, Liam, and I just laying in the grass watching clouds and watching airplanes, and that's the kind of stuff that I needed, Right. Because I just was not, it wasn't going to happen at where I wasn't going to function where I needed to at work. And I still got that support from my supervisor who just would like look at me and recognize like, this isn't going to happen today and that's okay, you know? And she really helped me just through that whole transition where like I have a lot of, um, I hold myself to a really high standard, and if I'm not going to meet that, then I'm just like, I'm a failure, and I suck, and I don't even know what I'm doing, (laughs) right? Why am I here kind of thing, and she sort of reined that in for me and provided some guidance, like, it's okay to not be okay. Do what's not, do something good for yourself. I can certainly relate to that in my experience at Peckham. Um, my diagnosis is major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. And one of my biggest fears about coming back to um, the work field after being off on disability was that I wouldn't be able to function to the level that I wanted to function, that, I've, that I know I've been able to function before. Um, I have been through one major depressive episode since I've been here at Peckham. And I believe that due to the supports that you talked about, you know, having a supervisor that said the same thing, if, if you need to work from home today because you can't be around people, we're good with that. That's, that's part of what we do here is making it so that you can function. Um, I, I felt very supported in, in doing that as well. I resonate with some of the things you guys said. So I have both a visual disability and um, mental health disorder. So I'm blind in my left eye completely. So my field of vision is like very narrow. Um, and I also have OCD. So I see some like interesting, like overlap with both of those diagnoses, um, diagnoses. I don't know how to say that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, but like in terms of working at Peckham, the ease of like having accommodations has been so helpful. Um, like, I don't have to worry about transportation, um, which is something, like, I've worried about my whole life because I can't drive. So Peckham's really made that easy. Um, and since I identify as a disabled artist, it's really important to me that I'm able to help, like, foster a community of other people who have similar feelings. Um, so working in the art studio with other people who have a variety of disabilities is really rewarding. Um, I think without like going too into like art making, um, but it's important to my position. Um, I found like having this type of position and being able to work with people in creative ways is a unique way to cope with having a disability. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are into art or anything like that, but um, 
it's a cool way to kind of process things that like otherwise I'm very uncomfortable talking about like this I'm pretty uncomfortable talking about Mm -hmm. um but that's been really helpful because like not only is it my job but I also feel like I'm finding ways to express myself that I otherwise wouldn't be able to do when you guys talk about your supervisors I want to talk about my my current supervisor when COVID-19 first hit I'm at high risk for COVID it terrified me. I'm like, oh my God, if I catch COVID, it's going to kill me or it's going to hospitalize me. And my supervisor was aware of how it was affecting me. And so there would be times when I would call him and we might just talk about Michigan State basketball. We might talk about what he's going to put on the smoker this weekend and how he's going to season it, what his little seasoning secrets are and we would compare notes and things like that and having that type of supervisor really enabled me to usah and and kind of calm down a little bit because he made a way for me to have a company laptop because I am at high risk so that I could work remotely um even when other things going on go on in my personal life or I had uh um, um, like six or seven deaths in my family within 12 months. My supervisor is like, he is awesome. It's like talking to him, he just like reassures me, everything is going to be okay. Your job is fine. If you need to take some time off, go right ahead. If you want to work remotely, go right ahead. I like what how Peckham puts the supports around us to succeed. Yeah. They try to set us up to succeed, not for failure. And for me, that is priceless, and that's why I'm still employed here. I like how you talked about that woo-sa moment when you were like, okay, I can like let my anxiety down a little bit. Like They're going to make a way for me. I can remember when that happened for me at Peckham. It was when I was working in NPIC, and it actually wasn't with myself. I had a coworker who was struggling with her depression that day, and she simply sent an email to her supervisor just saying, I can't be here today. Um, and, and the supervisor emailed back and said, no problem, we'll just pick up where we left off yesterday. And, and that for me was like clutch, that nobody's gonna question me. They're, they're not looking for um, how I'm gonna fail at this. They're not looking for me to have some type of verification. They're just trying to make it so that we all can do our job to the best of our ability, knowing that not every day is gonna be a good day. Um, You know, we're gonna have some moments where we need those accommodations. Also working in NPIC showed me um, on, on the scale of visible disabilities, I was so amazed at some of the disabilities that I, I saw in NPIC and the accommodations that they had in NPIC for allowing those with disabilities to work. It just made me even more proud to be part of this organization in knowing that that people want to work, um, people and that Peckham will do anything they can to make sure that we succeed. I don't think I've really experienced that here if I tell people this is my diagnosis or this is my history. People are really understanding here. I can say my family was like, you're seeking seeking treatment for what? Like you're, I mean, like I, I started counseling. I went to counseling when I was a teenager, but the, the counselor was awful. Like he wanted, he wanted to treat me for one thing, and then he sent me to like a substance use counselor. Substance use counselor sent me back to mental health, and I was like, this is bullshit. I'm not doing this because I'm not getting the help, and I'm, I felt judged. But anyway, so I started counseling when I was at MSU as a student, and I told my family, and some of them were like, like that's a weakness, right? Like you're, you're not strong enough to just deal with it and, you know, be stronger than your anxiety or your PTSD or the things that you've gone through and just get through it. So um, there's definitely like judgment and stigma that I experience with my family, but 
Um, and so then that, like, I think when I would first start talking about things with people, it was like, eh, are they going to judge me and like feel like that uncertainty? But um, now I'm just like, yeah, this is what I have. And I understand it now because I have gone through years and years of counseling and support and um, yeah. Interesting that you said that. When I first got my diagnosis about mm, almost 23 years ago, because I was raised up in the church, I was talking with a friend of mine in the church about my diagnosis, and her thing was, oh, well, just pray about it. Well, my philosophy is God put these doctors here for a reason. He intended us to, you know, not to bring religion into it, but that's where mm -hmm. my faith is. Mine too. He wouldn't have put the the, the these tools out here for me to use if he didn't intend me to for me to use them mm -hmm. and so it was like I kind of felt like I was being belittled and at that point I stopped talking about it with anyone mm -hmm. I didn't talk about it again like with my church family or mentors in the church again to some years later maybe about maybe 10 years later and when I was talking to one of my mentors and explaining to her about my diagnosis, she said, that makes sense as to what I saw in you growing up as a teenager, that that explains it. And from there, the support was, keep doing what you're doing. When people look at me now, who I am today versus who I was 25, 30 years ago, they're like, you're not the same person. Something about you has changed. Yeah, it's called therapy and, mm -hmm. you know, doing... Self-love. Self-love, <laughs> self-care, because I can yeah. honestly say that 25, 30 years ago when I yeah. looked in the mirror, I didn't like who I saw. I can't even say I loved who I saw. But when I look at who I am today, and again, it goes back to the supports that with Peckham and with therapy and things like that, I like who I see in the mirror today. And I'm looking forward to the future. I'm looking forward to how much more can I grow? How much more can I support other people in the same situation? Because I do, I do, I have supported team members here. I've had a team member in distress where I needed to try to help them through what they were doing, uh, going through at that moment in time. And it was, it was just like, it was just natural just to jump in. And help. Don't, I, so that's something that I think about a lot is, um, and I'm not sure if all of you, I, you just said you do feel that way, but we have a different perspective, right? Like we didn't learn this shit. Sorry if I'm not supposed to swear, but <laughs> <laughs> we didn't learn this in school, right? right like right, we didn't right. read about this in books. We lived this. Right? We lived it. So the experience and the way that we can help others is different because it's like, yeah, I, I do know how you're feeling because mm -hmm. I have felt that way mm -hmm. yesterday or two weeks ago or two months ago, and I can sit here with you in it, and we can go through it together in a different and unique way. Like, I I mean, I started at Peckham and, you know, did AmeriCorps and then moved into intake where I needed to understand accommodations and diagnoses. So I did read about that in books then, but it was the lived experience first that really helped me like when I would be talking to team members or potential candidates just like you I, I you can understand differently and I think that puts I just I think that's an advantage because then it's just like yeah I mean I'm not othering you you know mm -hmm. like it we're we're the same <laughs> yeah so I feel like that is a huge advantage. and I I think back to you know Riley saying like she's able to express things that she wouldn't otherwise be able to by doing art. You know, she learned that because that's how, that's a coping skill for her. I know for me, I waited for the treatment specialist position to come open at Footprints because I knew that I could relate so much to a lot of things that the girls were going through. And I wanted to work with treatment plans because that was clutch for me. You know, going to a therapist, going to the NAMI support group, learning self-care, all of those things that we put into the girls' treatment plans at Footprints. And like you said, I feel like it's an advantage. When I came here, I definitely wasn't the... I, I'm not the same person now as I was when I came here. So my outlook on that was different when I was in NPIC. I was just trying to see if I was going to be able to even function at a level where Peckham would keep me. But because of the supports in place there, you know, I was able to 
to come up and above of the expectations I had set for myself in the working world. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, like since coming to Peckham, I've been much more open about my disability, with disabilities. Um, like I used to be super secretive about it all through like school and growing up. Like I just did not want people to know. Um, but I feel like that was like more harm than good for myself. Um, cause now that people know, I think things that I do make more sense to them and they're like, Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> like that's like knowing this about Riley, like now I understand why she's running into walls or like not waving <laughs> at me when I wave because I can't see it. <laughs> um, like things like that, um, which like aren't big things, but it's nice that like people have this really big part of my identity, like in mind when interacting with me. Um, Cause it was weird to me that like, I, I think I like didn't accept that it was a part of me cause I wouldn't share it with people. And like, I felt embarrassed for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, especially as like a kid. Cause like kids can be kind of me, rotten. Awful. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> um, but like now being able to like talk about it, like, like 10 years ago, I would never be able to like, make a video about this um but yeah it is really helpful in like day-to-day interactions being open about it and like people having that perspective about me um like sure there are people that maybe have some judgments or like preconceived notions about it but um for the most part especially here at Peckham like it's done more good than anything and like going off what you said like having this conversation with people and like being able to relate with the people I work with feels really important um like you said we're not otherizing people it's like we're here together you know and I think that those people who do pass judgment or you know are like standoffish if you tell them there's so many like for me there's so many people in my life now that just embrace um this as part of me that the impact is less on when those people are turds to me, you know? Um, one of the other things that I want to mention is I, when I was working here, I got really sick and I lost hearing in this ear, in my right ear, most of my hearing. And I was the, I didn't tell anybody because I was embarrassed. Like the people are going to judge me or whatever. So I would just always like try to like talk to people on this side of me. And like, if we were walking, I would just, strategically move now my team like uh, any people that really know me and my team and the intake team know me really well some people in HR they'll be like am I on the right side do I need to move and it's like a joke now I'm like okay yeah we're with granny like I get it you know like granny can't hear so we laugh about it now and it like it just is so much nicer and like easier just like they understand it and they don't like they ask for, like, am I in the right spot? Can you hear me okay? And, like, they're really understanding about, like, if we go out somewhere and there's people everywhere, I'm not going to be able to hear what's going on. So I'll just be like, just text me. It's fine. (laughs) You know, we can laugh about it. It just makes a huge difference because for many years I was the same. Like, I just don't want people to know that this has happened and, you know, there's something wrong with me because I can't hear properly. But, I mean, it's while it's frustrating, like, it just is what it is, and people will adapt. And it... I, I um, was something you said, Riley, uh, reminded me of a, a story. When I was working over at the uh, Charlotte Peckham for the Eaton County Camwa, when I was going through um, a depressive episode, I would get, like, uncontrollable anxiety at some points in the day. And so I had downloaded the Calm app. And so I would just find random places in Charlotte to lay down and do some mindfulness or deep breathing. And so people would just pop up on me and in like random places, you know, the light would go on in the room or whatever. And they'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, it's good. You're good. I'm fine. And then from then on, it was like no big deal. Like, oh, no, Tracy's just doing her deep breathing here or there. And, you know, we're very... um very conscientious of it, very polite, very encouraging. Like, you know, if you need to take 10 minutes, um, do it. And I, that was helpful to me. Mm -hmm. I kind of think like, like disability aside, anybody who doesn't treat you well is probably dealing with something on their own end. Um, so I like try to keep that in mind because if I want them to keep something about my disability in mind, then like, 
I think I should also keep in mind that maybe they're going through something that they don't feel comfortable sharing. Um, so I guess like to answer your question, no, I don't try to change it. Um, like maybe like educating them about, hey, this is like what I'm going through. Like, just so you know, um, but it's not like I'm, I don't take it personally because like I always consider there's probably some like underlying situation, you know. For me, it's more, it's not so much here at work as it it was the community that I was living in. I lived in the same community for 19 and a half years. The last three and a half years of living out there, it seemed like, and it, it more so happened once COVID hit where I was working remotely. I had neighbors start focusing on me, like, trying to get into a confrontation with me. And it became, to, it got to the point where before I moved back to the city of Lansing in September, I literally was in fear of my personal safety from the neighbor that lived above me and her son. And to make a long story short, I ended up finding out their name and able to Google them and see online a little bit of their history. So with the mother, because the mother moved her son in, with the mother, she lived 13 different places in 21 years. And that was the first 21 years of his life. So the, the son never had a chance to put down roots and make friends and understand how to interact with people. And at first I was taking it personally because I was like, well, what am I doing wrong? What did I do to these people? But then after I did my research on them into like, it was like August when I was able to really do my research on them, I realized there wasn't nothing that I did wrong. It was something wrong with them. You know, for a mother to move her child around that much, who does that? You know, a child has to have stability and nurturing and caring. And this young man never had the opportunity to develop bonds and friendships with people. And that was all he knew was trying to intimidate people, terrorize people. And that had nothing to do with me. So I don't, I'm, at, as of today, I'm to the point now where I don't take it personally. Whereas I can't say six months ago, I very much still took it personally. I felt like it was an attack on me, and I, I'm trying to figure out, okay, I have gray hair. Obviously, you can tell I'm not 20 years old, <laughs> okay? So what would make a 29-year-old a man want to get into a confrontation with me and try to intimidate me? That I didn't do anything to him. That's something within him, and that's something he has to work on within himself. I broke my lease and got away from him because of my out of fear for my personal safety but it, it if people don't sometimes it's what a person is going through themselves I saw this on Dr. Phil this week um, this guy talked about he was a white supremacist at one point in time and he, he make a long story short he realized that it was his own self-hate of himself that he was projecting onto other people Jewish people African American people that it was all his own inner self-hate that was causing him to put this out there on people. It wasn't that they had done anything to him. It was something with inside him. So now, you know, with that being said, in my experiences, I, when I encounter, I call it foolishness, um, I know that it's not me. You know, it's not anything that I've done. It's something within that person that they have to heal within themselves that they've never tried to heal. Um, I just, like, in talking, when listening to you two talk, I think about, so I have always, ever since I can remember, and I've changed this now because of counseling, but um, if somebody were acting foolish mm -hmm. <laughs> on me um, or coming at me, um, my first reaction is always anger. So I would come right back at them. Like, you're going to come at me, I will come back at you with even more force and 
you know, we'll see how this is going to play out, right? Um, now, I what I do is, like, I know that feeling's coming. I can feel it inside. Like, I am going to have a freak out on this person or in general, and I know, like, I need to take a step back, check in with myself, like, really evaluate, like, this isn't about me. If this random person's coming at me, it's not about me. So just kind of, like, you know, do that, like, self-check, like, all right, what's actually going on? What is reality? What is not reality? What do I want to come out of this situation? And then, you know, if it is somebody that's, like, judging because of diagnosis or whatever, is it worth that to try and educate them, or are they just going to continue their jackassery and cause me to be even more upset? Right. Then is that worth my mental health to even go that route, you know? So it's a lot of, like, I got to do these, like, run through a checklist mentally and see, like, where am I at? Where is this person at? Um, because if I don't, then I just revert back to that anger and that – because really, um, you know, I know that I'm afraid. And so my first instinct when I'm afraid is just to be angry and mean because that will make that person go away real quick, right? <laughs> so now I, I know I don't want to, like – that's not actually who I am. When I like get to the core of my being, I am the complete opposite of that. Like I, I care a lot about people and want to help as much as I can and want to understand. So I have to like really just check in. And if I don't, then I, I mean, it's, it's so, it's so strange how like fast it just go. <laughs> um, I, I can relate to a lot of what um, Alex is saying. For me, in in recovery from my um, mental health, I've realized, and I say this a lot to the girls at Footprints: um, hurt people hurt people. So I know that I know who my supports are. I know who my mentors are. I know who to go go to if I need help with something. And so I just, I say that a lot to them, you know, hurt people, hurt people. And we can only be responsible for our reaction to them. So um, like Alex said, you know, I call it practicing the pause because I'm the same way when something, I can feel it in my body, which is something we're teaching the girls at Footprints, you know, what kind of alerts are your body giving you that you're going to get angry, that you're going to get out of pocket, that you're going to do something that you regret or is going to cause something that you don't want. And so we teach a lot of those skills at Footprints, you know, to evaluate what your body's going through, you know, do some grounding, some calming of yourself, and then move from there. But hurt people hurt people. I actually have a family member who knows about my issues, but they use my mental issues as a weapon against me. Mm. They're like, pick and poke and poke and poke to, to see if they can push me over the edge. And then once I react to being poked all the time, then it's, oh, oh my God, I don't know what's wrong with her. I haven't done anything to her. She's crazy. She needs professional help. Well, being here at Peckham in this almost last nine, almost nine years, I was able to develop an identity of who I am, of what Marsha is all about. So this particular family member no longer has that control over me to push me to where I have a mental meltdown. Mm -hmm. I've taken away that power. I've, and I've empowered myself to say, no more. I'm in control of Marsha. I'm in control of what's going on up here. And no one else has the right to force me over that edge. And it's sad in society, we have people who, if they realize somebody has a disability, they will take that disability and use it against that person as a weapon. And they enjoy it. So that goes back to what you said about hurt, hurt people hurting people. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's sad, but yeah, it's, it's reality. So by taking away this family member's power, I actually recognize now when this family member is trying to set me off, and I'm able to counter it and laugh about it. Oh, this person's trying to set me off. Ha, <laughs> joke's on you today. This is not happening. Those days are over with. And it goes back again to the mental health first aid training here, the support systems here at Beckham. They've 
enabled me to be able to stand and grow as a woman and stand on my own to where I recognize when things are going on now and not flying off the handle mm -hmm. or, or losing it, you know, mm -hmm. going over the edge. I don't do that anymore. Yeah. But it, it's, it is sad that we have people in, in our families that, like you said, will do foolishness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to that word again. Yeah, that's <laughs> you said that. That was your word. <laughs> How do you help people understand yeah. your experience? Yeah. I mean, so for me, um, it, it took me a long time, and I would say a long time being like within the last year that I've started to get comfortable with um, the severity of my anxiety. Um, I am, like if I get super anxious, I just, I shut down. People will then like view me as like, I'm a jerk, right? Like I, I'm not approachable, that kind of thing. Um, so I worked a lot with my counselor uh, just talking about, like, what if I just say, like, you know, I'm, I'm walking into this and I'm super anxious. Like, just, I'm tapping on the table, sorry. <laughs> you know, just, like, just put it out there, like, to start. Like, I'm feeling off today, I'm feeling this way or whatever. Just let the people know that I'm going to be working with. Like, this is where I'm at today. So, you know, like, it, not that it's, like, an excuse or whatever, it's just so that to help them understand I'm not going to be at my best or, you know, if I have to present in front of people, um, that takes a lot out of me and know that, like, like my team knows if I have to do, like, today, actually, we're going to, I'm going to Grand Rapids after this, my team knows that I will need some downtime after that because it's so draining for me. So I just try to talk more about it and be more open about it, which is the complete opposite of what I would have been a year or so or more ago. You know, just I would have just tried to push through and pretend like things were great and I loved every minute of everything that I was doing and that was even more exhausting, so. I think for me, I feel the same. Like talking to people about what it's like, some examples or giving experiences for one example, when I was going through my um, depressive um, episode and I was working at Camwa, my cubicle was right next to the phone that people would call for unemployment on. And for whatever reason, it just sounded so loud to me. So I would have to get up and walk away when somebody was using the phone or when it would ring, um, just letting them know that I'm just so hypertensive right now that I can't be in that space. And sometimes I'd work in a huddle because it was quiet in there and because um, I wasn't, you know, people weren't coming in the door every two seconds to get help at Camwa. And also, like you said about it being exhausting and needing some downtime after, it takes a lot of um, courage and a lot of strength to fight your mind all day, every day when you're going through something. And so just talking to people about that too, what it's like to battle all day inside your head. Um, I, I feel like that was helpful for me. For me, when I'm out on the production floor, I have super sensitive hearing. And hearing all of those sewing machines going at one time when I first started, when I would leave, I would have literally have a migraine headache. And that was a real battle for me at first. But then, I started listening to music when I was out on the floor. So there, by putting in my earbuds, I was able to control what was going into my brain, what was in my ears. And once I started listening to music when I was out on the production floor, my job performance increased. It, it got better because I was able to drown out all that. It was like, like rattling sounds, all these, these sewing machines in my ears, and it was spiking my anxiety but the, by listening to music and it just soothed me for me music is everything music and basketball they go together like peanut butter and jelly and so most, if you guys are ever out on the production floor and you see me out there you'll see me with my earbuds on and I tell the supervisors you know I explain to them I have to drown out some of this noise in order to be able to focus because the type of job I have if I make a mistake, 
on a time study, I could possibly cost a team member their job. Or I could possibly prevent them from getting promoted. You know, there's no room for mistakes like that. So when, if something is going on in my personal life and I'm not popping on all cylinders, as I call it, I take a step back. And my supervisor is okay with that. They know that I take a step back because what I do is crucial for our team members and for our production lines. And so it's like I, I appreciate being able to have that option to take a step back when things are out of control. Um, I don't, if, if I'm off, if I'm not popping on all cylinders, again, that's what I call it, mm -hmm. I take a step back, I isolate. I don't want anybody to be affected because if I'm not popping on all cylinders, my mouth might get me in trouble. I might say something that could cause me to be suspended for five days or even possibly terminate and lose my job. So it, for me, it's self-preservation that I, I'm aware of when this is going on, what I need to do to protect myself and others around me that they're not, that I'm not inflicting upon them what I'm going through at that point in time. Yeah, I think I really resonate with that. Um, like my journey with a disability, a lot of the things I do are self-coping. Um, I don't, I kind of want to talk about this. I don't know if people have anything to like add to it, but like I have a really hard time asking people for help. Um, <laughs> especially as like, this is like Women's History Month, we're talking about being women with disabilities. Yeah. Like asking for help as a woman, sometimes like, makes me question my, like, sense of independence or my strength or things like that, um, which, like, rationally I know is not true, but, like, there's, like, that, like, little voice in the back of my head. It's like, oh, just, like, do it yourself, figure it out. And, like, I think that's probably a big disservice to myself, like, just trying to, like, navigate the world how I can independently. Um, but, yeah, like, what is your guys' take on, like, asking for help or like resources or whatever. I can give you a specific incident that happened with what you're saying. Before COVID hit, I had interns that worked with me. And I had manufacturing engineering or engineering as a whole is a man's field. So when you have females coming into that field, they can feel some type of way. So I had this one intern. She would not ask for help if her life depended on it. And so I sat her down and I explained to her, hey, it's okay to ask for help. And that's when she explained to me that because she's a female in a man's field, that within her, she interpreted that as a sign of weakness for her to ask for help. That it's like she had to prove to herself that she was just as good as her male counterparts. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we, we had some conversations about that, and she got better with it. And it might have been because I'm a female also. I don't know, you know, now that she's graduated and where she's at now, if she's still doing that. But that was that's what came to my mind when I listened to you talk, was that conversation with that intern feeling like because she was working in a male-dominant field, it was not okay for her to ask questions. She had to stand strong. She had to be three times as good as the male counterparts, and, and it's sad that sometimes we as women feel that way, that we do have to work harder or we do have to keep things bottled up inside because we that we might feel like we're inferior to our male counterparts. I can feel you on that. Yeah, yeah. I um, So I grew up with three older brothers. My dad was a single dad. My mom moved out when I was, I don't know, 13 or so, um, and he was very much a single parent. And then when I moved out of my dad's house, I moved in with one of my brothers, and I was always, like, the cleaner-upper, you know? Like, it, like my dad was coming home. My, my brothers were really messy. Mm -hmm. I would clean up after them so that my dad wouldn't be mad when he got home. Um, and I always would just do things on my own, and I would not ask for help, even though, like, inside I was like, this is bullshit. Why am I doing this on my own? Blah, blah, blah. When I was, you know, started at Peckham, um, I 
kind of went about it the same way. Like, I don't need to ask for help. I'll just, I'll get it done, right? Like, and I'm going to be overwhelmed and it's fine, but I'm just going to, I'll figure it out and I'll get it done. When I moved into my first leadership role, is Caleb Adams when, was actually talking with me and he was like, Alex, I, I just want to remind you that you're not on your own little island. You're, you have support. You know, you have these people that are here to work with you and we want to help you. So if you're feeling like that, let us know. Like, we, we want to help. And him saying that, like, he said that to me, I don't know, a couple of years ago now. And that sticks with me, like, regularly. Like, you, you are not your own little island because that's how I really grew up, like, on my own little island feeling like I couldn't ask for help. And, um, you know, if I did ask for help, then people would think I was less than or not capable or whatever, but also because I just grew up with that background. Um, so I always have to, like, check myself with that and, like, be okay with asking for help or even, like, ask, like, taking the time off. Like, I, I've started to build into my regular schedule mental health days now mm -hmm. because I would just be like, well, I have to be here because if I'm not here – everything's going to fall apart, right? Like, because I'm holding it all together. And I took a week off in the summer. And I, I mean, my team is amazing. And, I, and they, everything ran really smoothly. They figured it out. And I'm like, okay, so now I have learned to trust that a little bit more. So it's just getting used to like, relying on others, and they're not going to fail you. I think like, for me, part of that too, is trauma teaches you you can't trust anybody and they're going to fail you and that's that's it right so i had to start to unlearn that too but it's not easy like i still will like find myself piling up my plate and i have too much on my plate because i don't want to ask for that help so yeah i totally get that especially like asking for help related to like my disability is really hard yeah like i have like i don't know i i keep feeling like i see it as a weakness in a way mm -hmm. um which, like, isn't true, yeah. um, but, like, I keep having to, like you said, like, keep myself in check, like, asking for help's okay, like, mm -hmm. having accommodations is okay, like, these are things that, like, lack of better words, like, level the playing field, so why shouldn't I be able to do what somebody else is able to do, Absolutely. if it just mm -hmm. takes, like, an extra tool to get me there, you know? Yeah. I think for me, it goes back to that wusa moment that I talked about earlier, being in NPIC and seeing somebody send an email to a supervisor saying, I'm not at my um, level of functioning today that I could be of use here. And that being okay, there wasn't judgment. Like I said, they didn't ask for verification of something. They just said, okay, we'll see you tomorrow when you're feeling better. And if not tomorrow, we'll see you the next day. And I really feel like that took a lot of weight off my shoulders. And honestly, just in, and it continued, you know, into youth services, into my current role at Footprints. Um, it's, it's eased me a lot to know that if, if you need something, if, um, if you're struggling, that it's okay to ask for help, that nobody's going to judge you for that, that it's not a weakness, that we all need those that time off to be able to recharge and be the best version of ourselves that we can be. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really easy for me. Like my, I, I have a team of, I don't know, 14 people, I think. And if they're like, I need this, you know, monitor or whatever, like in as, as far as accom accommodation, I'm like, yeah, why wouldn't we do that for you, right? But then if it's me, it's like, you know, it's probably fine. Like, I can probably just live with it like this, even though I know that would make it a little bit easier for me. I'm not, like, the best advocate for myself. And I know, like, I've worked on that, but, like, it still is harder for me. Like, if Tracy came up to me and was like, hey, I need help with this, I'm like, sure, drop everything. Let's help her, right? Yeah, right. But if, like, she were to come to me and be like, I can see you're struggling, you need a little help, I'd be like, oh, no, 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 it's fine. I got it. Even yeah. though I'm, like, sweating and, like, <laughs> right. you know, dying for help, I'm like, I, you know, it's good. So, yeah, it's You'll go, much like, the easier. extra mile for anybody but yourself. Yeah, it's you so know? much easier to yeah. do that. Um, I think working at Peckham, though, has helped me to really see, like, it's mm -hmm. okay to say, I actually do need help or this mm -hmm. actually would help me to do, perform my job better because it's for lack of better word the norm here it's mm -hmm. normal that people need a little extra support or mm -hmm. need that special accommodation so it's sort of taken that 
I don't stigma out of it or, um, you know, that this, it's not actually a sign of weakness. It's just to help me perform my job better, but it still is really challenging. That's one that I struggle with still. Well, we're all a work in progress. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs>